is gone. He's at, well, he's just now leaving death's doorstep. I left earlier in the week. Um, but he wanted me to get started. Let's, uh, let's just go ahead and start with a prayer. Pam has, uh, has glittered, and we don't have much time, so. <laughs> Father, what an, uh, what an exciting journey we've been on with Pam. It, uh, it's been very interesting, and I, I, for one, have enjoyed it, and I just uh, I pray blessings over Pam this morning. I pray that she uh, has the words to speak, and I pray that we have the ears to listen. Uh, Father, we, uh, we love gathering up like this, and we love uh, spending time in your word. We just ask for blessings this morning, and it's through Jesus I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. I have passed out a lot of cards today, and I've been passing these out, and I'm going to be presenting these same lessons beginning in February on Wednesday nights to the um, high school kids. So leave those cards here so I don't have to make them every time. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I love making that stuff. I'm getting mom with me every Saturday night. We cut and paste, and it's, it's just so great to be with mom. And um, she just looks forward to it. Are we going to make your little cards, she says, every night. So that's really good, and I, it's been such a blessing. Okay, Kimmy, if you would, if you would stand up and face the crew and start out with our, and the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. And what are they? Repeat after me. Passover. Passover. Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. First fruits. First fruits. Pentecost. Pentecost. Trumpets. Trumpets. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Tabernacles. Tabernacles. Those are the seven feasts. What does the number seven mean? Covenant. Who said it? Give her a hand. Yes. What is a covenant? What does a covenant mean? I am yours and you are mine. That's right. I'm going to be yours and you're going to be mine. Very good. All two, two feasts came later. I mean, they're not included in Leviticus 23, but they are Purim. And Hanukkah. Hanukkah. So we're going to go over those two. Quick review. Number one, who did God send as a deliverer to lead his Hebrew slaves out of Egyptian captivity? Moses. Moses. How many plagues did it take before Pharaoh finally agreed to let God's people go? Ten. Good job. Why, oh, why did it take ten mighty plagues before this proud, arrogant man was humbled? Why ten? Very good. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> Very good. God sent ten plagues, and each plague atta attacked one of the gods of Egypt. And so God was trying to prove to three different groups of people that he had the power. Group one. The Egyptians. The Egyptians. Group two. Yes, group three. Yes, you guys are learning. I'm so proud of you. Okay, four. Why did God's people believe? God's people, why did they believe the, the Egyptian gods were stronger than their god, Elohim? And that's right. And what, was, what kind of situation were they in? Bondage. Bondage. That's right. So they thought, surely Elohim is weaker. They believed in him. They trusted him, but they didn't think he was very strong. We're tempted to have that same attitude, aren't we, from time to time? Okay, uh, where am I now? What did Moses tell the Hebrew slave? Now, I have passed out red polka dot cards with the answer. So you guys can read that off. What, what did Moses tell the Hebrew slaves to do in preparation for the coming of the avenging death angel? One. One, you did that so good. <laughs> Two. On the first full moon of spring, slaughter the lamb and sprinkle the blood on the doorposts and the lintels of their doors. Yes. Three. Roast the lamb and eat it. Very good. Four. Eat unleavened bread, the bread of haste. Five. Eat bitter herbs and wine and have no bitter complaints. Six. And wash wash, wash the, for this is the night of watching. The night of watching. What did we call that? Lael what? Lael Shimmerim, the night of watching. Very good. You guys are doing so good. Now, Amy, I know you're going to get this one. How were the Hebrew slaves to dress for their mighty exodus? Sandals on, coats on, belts on, standing up and eating. Very good. Who was the death angel 
Who would the death angel slay if there were no blood on the doorpost? Firstborn what? Male of every what? Even the stables and the barns. Very good. When the Egyptians were screaming, the Egyptians were screaming because they had discovered that their firstborn males had been slain, why were the Hebrews celebrating? Right. What had Pharaoh ordered them? Get out. And so they were celebrating. Why is the feast called Passover? The death angel passed them over. Why did the death angel pass over the Egyptian, the Hebrews? Because the blood of the lamb. For 430 years to the day of their bondage, God set them free. Is that awesome or what? You know, that is awesome. Praise God. Um, God told his people, celebrate this Passover every year on the first what? Full moon of spring. Very good. Feast, this feast, Passover, is the foundational feast on which all these others are built. That's what I want you guys to remember. And redemption, say that. Redemption, redemption is, is, the awesome, is the awesome message that God was trying to get to his beautiful, wonderful people who were so enslaved. Now, um, <clears throat> it's the time that God kept his four promises to his people. I didn't pass out cards this week on these four promises because I expect by now you remember them. Four promises were what? Number one. I will bring you out. Number two. Number three. Number four. Okay, that's good. It's a little weak, but I'll take it. <laughs> we'll try it again. I'll bring you out. I'll set you free. I'll redeem you. And I'll make you my own. Which of those cups, which of those promises did Jesus turn into our communion, part of our communion meal? Which one? Try again. Who said it? Who said it? Give her a hand. <laughs> the cup of redemption. That's so cool. Very good. You guys are learning. That's great. I got to take a little swig. Can you guys believe you're making me nervous? <laughs> okay, this single, this single event, this Passover event, what I want you guys to understand was as important in the mind of God's nation as the, as the death of Jesus Christ is to the Christian church. That was the, that was the ginormous event of all of their history was the Passover delivering them from bondage. And isn't that our most celebrated fact that we've been delivered by the blood of God's Passover lamb? All people, all people before the cross and after the cross that were redeemed were redeemed by what? The blood of the Passover lamb. Very good. Very good. Quick review. We're still reviewing. What does L-O lamb mean? God of the big picture. What else? Everlasting to everlasting. The ageless God. The eternal God. Very good. Okay, who was the first person to call God L-O lamb? Abraham. What two events had just happened in this old man's life when he finally called God L-O lamb? He gave up his son and, his, and his, well, his well was seized. Very good. Um, what did Abraham do after he realized that God was the God of the big picture? He what? He planted a tamarisk tree. Very good. Why was that such, why was that such an odd thing to do? It's a slow-growing tree. Why in the world would Abraham go out and plant a slow-growing tree? Yeah, because he's saying, I believe, I believe, I believe in a God that I don't fully understand and I don't see the picture and it's cloudy and it's foggy to me, but I believe in a God that sees it all. That's the God we serve. That's the God we have to learn, that he sees our sorrow and he sees our heartache and he sees our brokenness. Can we believe him for the future? Then make an investment in his kingdom. That's what people of faith do. They make an investment in a kingdom of God. That's so awesome to me. Okay, where I am on my questions. You guys are doing so good. Uh, da, da, da. Six, what's the second descriptive name of God that we learned in this series? I about wiped my glasses off. Elohim. Elohim is the God 
awesome and mighty in creation. In your Genesis story, Elohim created. Elohim created. Elohim created. Elohim is the God. Awesome and mighty and powerful in creation. The God who swore a covenant. What's a covenant? I yearn and do not. Say it again. I yearn and do not. The God who swore a covenant with himself. Why? For there was no one greater by which to swear that he would never stop his work, never stop his labor until what? Until all things are restored and made whole. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God that we need to sink our teeth into that's going to really carry us through those dry, barren times in our lives. I just love the study of the names of God. What price did Jesus have to pay to make us his and him ours? What price? What was the bride's price? What, was, what price did Jesus have to pay? His death. Yes, his crucifixion. He bled out for us. Passover is a picture, a picture, a picture. Who's the reality? Jesus Christ. Very good. You guys are doing so great. There are seven feasts. We went over that. What day did God add to creation that is his covenant day? His Sabbath. What does the word Sabbath mean? No, in this series. You guys, that's great, but we're on a whole new series. The word Sabbath is closely related to the word covenant and oath and seven. Is that cool? Which of your Ten Commandments speaks of not adulterating your covenants? Seven! Does that blow your mind or what? I mean, is that just like God? <laughs> that he would make that Number seven, he could have made it anything. Remember your covenants. That's what he's saying to us. Very good. The, the word covenant is wedding language. Why? Why is that word covenant wedding language? Very good. Very good because you're making a covenant with your spouse. And you're saying, I will be yours and you will be mine. And I will never, never leave you no matter the heartache or sorrow we are in this for the long haul that's what a covenant is it is wedding language um, in the Hebrew to remember is not simply to recall an event but in the Hebrew way of thinking what does remember mean an intense focus an intense focus that allows that memory to shape us, change us, and direct us. That's why Jesus says all the time, remember, don't just recall that event, remember, focus on that intently so you can live for me and bring honor and glory to my name. The world is starved for that kind of faith. Okay, today we're going to be looking at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, I have posters up here, and this is a piece of unleavened bread. That's not a pegboard. Everybody always says that looks like a pegboard. But really, if you look at it, doesn't it sort of kind of look like unleavened bread? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, a lot of people think Passover and unleavened bread are a single feast, but they're not. They are celebrated together, but they're not a single feast. Passover... Is, a, is one feast, 24 hours, celebrated on the first full moon of spring. Pass, uh, unleavened bread, then, is the seven following days, okay? So, Passover is celebrated for how many days? One. How many days is Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrated? Seven. seven. Gee, what do you think God's trying to tell us? Covenant. Remember my covenant. And every time you see seven, seven in the Bible, what are you going to know from here on out? Remember my covenant. It's just sprinkled all through the pages of the Old Testament. And God's people were picking up on this. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We have, how many of you guys have ever studied these feasts before? I didn't study these feasts. At one, I think we have one hand. I didn't study these feasts until 2013. You know, and, and so a lot of people ask me, how come we didn't know about these feasts? So I'm going to spend just a few minutes trying to kind of clear the dust on this. In, in, a, in a nutshell, guess what? History had played a huge role in this. Remember the pork roast I showed you guys the first week I was here? What was the story of the pork roast? Pardon me? 
The panel's too little. Tradition. We just do the same thing over and over and over again, and tradition is so awesome and wonderful until it controls you, until it owns you. So we got to look at history a little bit and see why we haven't plugged in to this awesome study of all these wonderful feasts. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go back a little bit further in time, and we're going to talk about a beautiful Jewish tree, family tree. That's what I have before you today, this beautiful family tree supposed to be an olive tree it's the best we could do okay now Paul the Apostle spent a lot of time in Romans 11 trying to explain to us we Gentiles that we have been grafted in this beautiful family tree that belongs to the patriarchs right I mean I, I, I learned it when I was a little kid a song and I want you guys to sing it with me if you remember it because the roots of this beautiful olive tree are in the patriarchs once there were three wandering Jews. Once there were three wandering Jews. Wandering, wandering Jew, Jew, Jews. Wandering, wandering Jew, Jew, Jews. First was three wandering Jews. The first one's name was Abraham. The first one's name was Abraham. Abra, Abra. Abra, Abra. First one's name was Abraham. The second one's name was Isaac. The second one's name was Isaac. I. I. The second one's name was Isaac. The third one's name was Jacob. The third one's name was Jacob. J. J. Third one's name was Jacob. They all went down to Jericho. They all went down to Jericho. Jerry, Jerry. Jerry, Jerry. All went down to Jericho. We learned that, guys, when we were kids. Why do you have to get this in your kids? Why? Because we remember how long. I didn't tell Kim we were going to sing this song. It just bobbed up to the surface of her gray matter somehow. <laughs> Why'd they go to Jericho? Because Jericho was the doorway to the promised land. Give God a shout, glory, hallelujah. Because he's El Olam, the God of the big picture. And this beautiful Jewish tree, this family tree, has a beautiful gold. You see that? You guys tell that's different? That's Jesus Christ. Jehovah said, can you, God, our righteousness, the righteous branch. Why is Jesus in this tree, guys? I want to ask you, who's got the green card, fluorescent green? Jesus came through the Jewish people, people number one. Jesus was born a Jew. Number two. Jesus had Jewish parents. Mary was a Jew, God was his father. Three. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Four. Jesus lived under Jewish law. Five. That's right, he did. That's not great. Six. Jesus lived a Jew, Jesus died a Jew. That's right. So wonderful. Do you see this? Do you see this beautiful branch? That's Jesus. Now look. You see these old gnarly things that have been grafted in? That's us. That's the Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And I'm pretty sure all of us in here are Gentiles. That's this is old gnarlies. Isn't that beautiful? We've been adopted. I want to tell you guys something. I have two beautiful granddaughters that have been adopted, Savannah and Aubrey. And I want to tell you something. Those little girls had nothing to do with it. They were young, and they were helpless, and they were wee ones, and their mom and dad paid a huge price to adopt them. You guys ever, who in here is familiar with adoption? Let me tell you something. They agonized over that. They paid great financial fees for that. They took home studies. They jumped through hoops. They had, house, they had their house inspected. They were checked by the FBI. And those two little girls had nothing to do with the fact that they were adopted in, grafted into that Spillis family. And let me tell you something. We didn't have anything to do with it either. That's what I want us to understand. We're those hellion Gentiles, right? Say it. Hellion Gentiles. When the Jews were celebrating, green polka dotted card. When the Jews were celebrating, number one. Their redemption from Egyptian slavery. Number two. Number three. Four. Five. 
five. Those roots, patriarch six. Very good. When that was happening in the life of the Jew, you want to know where we were? You want to know where the Gentiles were? We were over at the altar worshiping false gods. And God, because he's so awesome and mighty and loved all of his children, we've been invited into this beautiful Jewish family tree. You know what that means? That means these feasts are your feasts too. And we need to plug into the richness of what God has laid out for not just the Jewish nation, but for us all gnarly Gentiles because we can celebrate our redemption too. And that brings such joy and warmth to my little old dusty heart. Very good. The Passover lamb, his blood was shed for all of us. Now, what, we are, what we're going to do now, we're welcome to share into the riches that have come to us through a what? Who has the blue cards? Baby powder, baby blue. We get to share in the riches that have come to the Gentiles through what? A Jewish nation, a Jewish nation too. A Jewish, book. a Jewish book, which is what? The Bible. Three. A yes, a Jewish bloodline. Four. A yes, and five. A Very good. For when Jesus sends out his invitations, he sends out a lot of them. And everybody is invited to share into the beautiful redemption of our Jewish Messiah. What's his name? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Very good. So, we Gentiles we Gentile, saved by the blood of the Lamb are welcomed into this awesome um, redemptive program and it makes me want to do backwards flips. That's just what it does for me. I just stand sometimes in awe of what's, what God's done for me. Because let me tell you something. I didn't know about the seven feasts of Israel. I mean, I could have named them. I learned them in Sunday school. Did you guys learn them in Sunday school? I learned them right here in this church in Sunday school. I could have named them. I didn't know a thing about them other than their names. I didn't know about Lael Shemarim until a few years ago. I didn't know um, about the four promises. I'd heard the Passover story since I was a child. I'd never heard about the four promises. What are they? One. Good two, three, four. I didn't know about those. I didn't know about the descriptive names of God until I was 43 and I was raised in the church. Why have that, why has that, those nuggets of treasure been hidden? That's what people keep asking me. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to clear that up for you. But before I get started, I've got a little fluorescent pink card I need to go over. All of these feasts and all of these festivals are such goodness. We need to what? They need to be what? Excavated, Excavated two, the three, four, five, six. Celebrated. These are so good. And the wonderful thing about these feasts is that we do get to smell them and taste them. It's not just a cold intellectual sermon. I've heard thousands of cold intellectual sermons, and I'm sick of them, quite frankly. <laughs> can you give me a hearty amen? Amen! We want something we can smell and taste and, and look at and touch. That's what's so awesome about God's Old Testament. You know, it's, it's just, that's how God taught through things you can experience. I just love it. That's just the only way I can learn. It's so, it's so good. So we need to figure out for a minute why in the world, how we lost these. And I'm going to fly through this because in history past, Rome ruled the day. Say Rome. 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 And Christianity was, we were in our infancy, okay? But we were growing. But Rome ruled the day and conquered huge, vast holdings of land, very diverse people, far away and near. I mean, Rome was ginormous. And Rome needed a way to unite all of these different people. <clears throat> and Rome decided to do that through emperor worship. Say that. Emperor, emperor worship. worship. The vast empire would now be united under the banner of emperor worship. Now, the emperor did not care how many gods you worshipped. And in that culture, how many gods were there? In the Roman world, hundreds. And the emperor didn't care how many gods you worshipped as long as as you worshiped him first. Got it? So what happens is the Jews at that time were very powerful and influential and actually were around a long time before Rome. Rome was much younger than, than the Jewish people. And so anybody that traveled, and you think there wasn't travel back then? There was travel back then. And anybody back in that empire that traveled, 
knew about the Jewish people because they were the weird ones, right? They were a peculiar people. Say that. They were peculiar because they worshipped one God only, the unseen God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were seen as peculiar. And guess what? We're supposed to be seen as peculiar too. I wonder if we are. <laughs> Lisa's saying we are. we are. We are. Good job. That encourages my heart. Give Lisa a hand. That encourages my heart because we need to be seen as peculiar. So let me tell you something. In this crazy world of emperor worship, this crazy world of emperor worship, the Jews got something that was really very, very special to them, and it was called a legal exemption. Say that. A legal exemption. From worshiping the emperor. They did not have to worship the emperor because Rome gave them a legal exemption. You guys thought legal exemptions were just kind of new with this newest administration? No, 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 no. Legal exemptions have been around forever. And the Jews were lucky enough to get one. And that legal exemption told the Jewish people, you don't have to worship the emperor. Isn't that cool? That's really great. But now Christianity's coming into the picture. And at first, all Christians were Jews. You got that? Because on the day of Pentecost, that barn red poster, 3,000 Jews, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 3,000 Jews were like, oh man, he's the long-awaited Messiah. And 3,000 of them were baptized. The beginning of the church. They were all Jews. you got to understand that. There was no New Testament at the time. These people were convinced that Jesus was Messiah based on what book? The Old Testament. It's in there. It's awesome. And they're like, whoa, come into, the, come into the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, and being baptized. That is so cool. But most of the powerful leaders in Judaism did not accept Jesus as Messiah. You got that? Now, these leaders were really powerful. These Jewish leaders were powerful and influential. And I can prove it to you by the fact that they pressed Pontius Pilate. Who was he? The Roman governor. They pressured him into crucifying Jesus when he did not want to. That shows you their power and how they were pressing this, this Roman governor into the corner. Anyway, Jesus is crucified, then the resurrection. Okay, And all these Jews were coming to the, to the Jewish Messiah. But this caused tension between the, between the Jews and the Gentiles who were accepting Jesus as their Messiah. It's causing some tension and some pressure. And so Gentiles saw themselves as, guess what the Gentiles, that's you and me, were beginning to see themselves as? Gnarly, Gnarly roots that were what? Grafted, Grafted in. That's how they started seeing they started seeing themselves as that because that's what they were. Because who's got the polka dotted card? Number one, the Gentile Christians were what? Barbara, one. They worship the Jewish Messiah. That's right, number two. Three. They were baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. Say that one again. They were baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. Yes, four. Yeah, woohoo! Four. They accepted the Ten Commandments and blessings to their lives. Five. They read the Jewish Bible. Six. They learned from the Jewish prophets. Seven. They devoted their lives to worship God alone. Yes, but they were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. Okay, you got that picture? And so we started having some tension because the Jews, what the Jews have? Legal. They had the legal exemption. The Gentiles, for, for the first few years of Christianity, were hiding under this legal exemption, okay? There became great tension and pressure because the, the Jewish people at the time wanted to distance themselves from the Christians. You got that? They didn't want the Christians to have this legal exemption. And so all of that was happening in Rome to try to decide if the Christians would get that legal exemption. And guess what? They did not. They did not get that legal exemption, and so they became viewed as rebels in the state. Rome, Rome stamped them as rebels, and so persecution broke out against the Christians. Okay, And so what happened is it's, it's caused hard feelings between the Christians and the Jews. Do you guys get that? The Christians are like, let us use your legal exemption. And the Jews are like, not on your life. And so the Christians then had to scatter because they were getting persecuted. And what happened then, the Gentile church started growing and growing and diving into the new and growing New Testament, right? 
right? And so what happened in time, the church, the dominantly Gentile church, came up with their own feasts and festivals and holy days. Who's got the card that starts off with all these feasts and festivals? It's kind of a blue polka dot card. Give me one. Who's got one? Easter, Easter two. Christmas. Very good. Three. Ash Wednesday. You guys celebrate Ash Wednesday here? No. Four. You do, don't do Lynn either, do you? Five. Do you do Good Friday? Yeah. <laughs> Ever Friday. Okay. Okay. Very good. Six. Monday, Thursday. You guys do Monday, Thursday? Oh, what you miss. Seven. You drink your beer green on St. Patty's Day? <laughs> Eight. <laughs> That's right. Very good. Now, let me, guys, let me tell you guys something. These aren't evil days. These aren't evil celebrations. Would you agree? I agree. You know, there's a void in that new and growing Gentile church. There's a void because these were left in the dust because their feelings were hurt over all that history. And so the Gentile church said, we need to come up with our own feasts and festivals. And I love them. Don't you love them? Because God takes delight in people who try to please and honor him, right? And so we need to celebrate all of those feasts we just read off. But why should we neglect these? What did your card say, Kim? Read it again loudly. The gold one. <laughs> Doesn't that make you want to cry? These are our feasts too. Why? Where's my gnarly root? Why are these our feasts too? Because we're grafted in to this wonderful program of redemption. And these feasts lay them out so beautifully. And as we keep going over them, you're going to realize that God keeps his four promises. What are they? Number one. Louder. Two. Three, four, what an awesome God we serve. Okay, that's review. Now, now let's get, up, let's get, let's get to the second feast because I, you know what? You, we got to fly. Okay, we're not opening that door until 1030 unless you have to go get kids. Now, many people think Passover and Unleavened Bread are the same feast. They're not. They're, they're two. How many days is this one celebrated? Seven days. What does seven mean? Very good. So what happens is, you know, I don't want to get technical about this, but as you start learning these feasts, you need to take them home and celebrate the heart of these feasts in your home. Don't get bound up in bondage. How many of you guys are finally getting set free from all that bondage that drug us down for so many years? Raise your hand. Yes, don't go back there. But look at the beauty of these and celebrate the spirit of what God's trying to show us in his ancient feast. It's so wonderful. After Passover, when the Passover lamb was slain, God told his people, don't put yeast in your bread. Collect your bread. It's the bread of haste. Get out of here and shag that joint. God's ancient people did not have packets of yeast like this. You guys ever seen this? They didn't have packets of yeast like this. They collected their yeast off of grape leaves because there's yeast in the air and it settles on grape leaves and they would snatch those grape leaves and make their bread rise. God said, don't even let anything touch. Don't even let yeast touch your house. Nothing of, your, nothing of yours. No yeast for seven days. Celebrate my festival of unleavened bread. For how many days? Seven. What kind of bread? Unleavened. Why? I wonder why would these people have to celebrate a feast of unleavened bread? And I'm going to tell you because in the Bible, fe uh, yeast is always a picture of sin. Say it. Sin. sin. Yeast is a picture of what? Sin. sin. And God is saying, rid your houses of sin. Rid your houses of yeast. A picture, a picture, a picture of what? Sin. sin. Get rid of it for how many days? Remember my covenant. Focus on my covenant. Clean your house of the yeast of sin for seven days and think of what kind of bread? Unleavened, unleavened bread. Figure that. Figure that. Who's the unleavened bread? Jesus Christ. Remember, Pat broke it. This is my body. Did they get it? Did they understand it fully? No, it's a picture. It's a picture. It's a picture of who? 
Jesus, our Messiah. Very, very good. And we got the neat thing about this feast is the children were always included. I sat right, uh, Mom sat right here last week and I sang that beautiful song to you, guys. <laughs> Jesus went about doing good. The only two people that knew it was, did you know it? I had not, never heard it. Okay. Me and Mom. And so I got home. I said, Mom, you know, no, she wasn't listening at home. Uh, she was always a spoiled one. <laughs> But I got home, I said, where did I learn that song? Because you and me, apparently, she said, Dawn learned it. My oldest sister learned it in the second grade. And I taught it to you, girls. I apparently was the only one listening. (laughs) But (laughs) did you see? Oh, yay. But I said, you know, you taught that to me. I was four years old. I had never been, I'd never sang that song since I was preparing my notes. That rested in my heart, in, the, in my soul, in my spiritual bone marrow for 50 years. It's so wonderful that my mom and dad taught us the things of God. Because even if children wander away from the faith, they have a place to come home if they know Jesus. Teach your kids. Say it. Teach your kids. Teach your grandkids. It doesn't take a lot, but it takes some. And we've got to get these feasts back in the home. It's all Awesome. Get it in the home. Get it in the home. We must teach our children. Now, face of unleavened, unleavened bread. I'm so excited I can't even talk. God expects his people to rid their homes of the yeast of what? Sin. Sin. That's right. Now, in this celebration, what the family would do was the parents would hide little pieces of bread, yeasty, yummy bread, not unleavened bread, all oh, that good stuff. All over the house, I've got a list. Donuts, Little Debbie snacks, hamburger and hot dog buns, loaf bread, bagels, brownies, cupcakes, muffins, all that stuff you try to stay away from when you're trying to lose some weight. The parents would hide these all over the house. And then the whole family together would hunt them out, search them out. And this side of the room, you guys are on Easy Street. This side of the room, I've got little yeasty yummies hidden all over this side of the room, behind the blinds, under that, under that tablecloth, under your chairs. So go ahead and search out the, the yeast of sin on this side of the room. Now, when you find it, <laughs> when you... No, that, no, there's none up here. Okay, we're on a short time schedule. Now, when you find your yeasty bread, when you find your yeasty bread, please notice that there's a sin. Uh, tacked on that bread. Now what you're going to have to do, the family would search this out together. Mom and dad, the little children, the boy, the brothers and sisters, grandma and grandpa, if they live there. And they would bring all of the yeasty goodies in a box because the parents were going to take the children out and burn this up. You have two. Good. So if you have a, a yeasty goodie, Read your sin. If you're too shy to read your sin, give it to somebody beside you who will. Come beside me and, and Zach, you're first right here. The silent treatment? Okay, the silent treatment. Okay, Does that ever happen in your homes? Okay. The next, just come on up. Right on up here, one at a time. What does yours say? Getting drunk. Getting drunk. Okay. <laughs> Not saying that happens to you guys, you know, personally, but. Stealing. Stealing. Now, let me tell you guys something when they're coming up here. This was collected in the home. Say it. In the home. Because you, look, I can come to church just a minute, and I can fool you, right? And you can fool me. But you can't fool your kids, and you can't fool your spouses, and you can't fool God. This is why the home is so awesome. Okay, ma'am. Cussing at your family. Cussing at your family. That doesn't happen, does it? Degrading your spouse. Degrading your spouse. Hmm. Not paying your bills on time. Now this one is surely Gary. Being a, poor, a royal pain in the butt to live with. Okay. That, <laughs> now, you, r- real quick, Louie. Real quick. That really brings me to a point. <laughs> the Bible tells us to clean the yeast out of your own self. <laughs> and I thought I might forget that, but Louie, thank you. Okay, ma'am. 
Neglecting the church. Neglecting the church. Husbands allowing the wives to leave. Husbands, would that happen in Christian homes? I'm, talk, I'm talking Christian homes now. <laughs> cruel anger. What's that? Con cruel anger. That's what I said to you. Lying. Lying. Hmm. Being heartless to your spouse. Being heartless to your spouse. Laziness. Laziness. Are those dishes done? Are those beds made? <laughs> complaining spirit. A complaining spirit. Manipulation. Manipulation. Neglecting your children. Very good. Neglecting your children. And these would all be put in a box. And the family would go out together and burn this up. <laughs> the children would see the fire. They would smell the smoke. They would witness the fact that mom and dad have just come clean and said, I want to confess and rid my house of the yeast of what? Sin. sin. But these are obvious sins. These are obvious sins. There's, a, there's another type of yeast that God tells us, do a careful search. Do a careful search because those hidden sins are the sins that destroy. Yeast is an example, a picture, a picture, because yeast, a little bit of yeast works through the whole lump, right? And God is trying to tell his people, if you don't rid yourselves of the yeast of sin, in the home, where? In the home, it permeates through your, through your body. It permeates through the spouse you live with. It's permeated and grows into your children and you destroy your kids because we refuse as redeemed sons and daughters of the king to get sin out of our houses. So this side of the room, you get to search your side for those more hidden sins. So start looking. I wouldn't have left you guys out for nothing. And I need a bigger box. You guys are a sinful bunch. Forgiving heart. Not keeping, your word. Not keeping your word. Children catch on to that real fast. Stuff in the truth. It's a biggie. Always stirring up problems. Always stirring up problems. <laughs> I, I didn't say they're particularly your sin. Sorry you got that one. Pornography. <laughs> He's like, I'm new here and I get pornography. Sacred addictions. Very good. Resentful of others' talents. Resentful of others' talents. That's a sin that festers in your heart because you want to be number one. Isn't that disgusting? Yeah, but don't we, aren't we that way? I mean, I am. I work on it. Being sexually selfish with your spouse. Oh, that's one that nobody would really know about, right? It's a hidden sin. It causes so many problems. Hidden adultery. That's another one that causes a lot of problems. Always quitting a job. Always quitting a job. Presenting your adult responsibilities to your family. Very good one. Rage and violence toward your family. Very good. See, that would be one that maybe nobody would know about. But these are celebrated in the home. And these people, these, these mommies and daddies and children would do what 
God commanded them to do, and they would clean the yeast of sin out of their home. Guys, do you know how much this stuff costs? Ninety-two dollars. <laughs> I'll just tell you. When you get rid of sin in your life, you can expect that it's going to cost something. Do you understand that? I wish I had a time in here for testimonials where people could come up here and say, let me tell you what sin did what sin did to me, what it cost me. And so this is costly. And the family takes it out, trusting that God will fulfill what they have lost, that God will restore all the expense. And they take this out, and they douse it with lighter fluid, and Papa throws a match on it, poof, and they watch it all burn up. is that awesome? That is so awesome. Rid your homes. Your what? Your homes from the yeast of what? Sin. For how many days? Seven. God, what does seven mean? Seven. Yes, I will be yours and you will be mine. God told his family, his family, get rid of the yeast of sin. It's destroying you. It's permeating in your marriage. It's growing into your children. Let me tell you guys something. I love grace and mercy. I love grace and mercy. We talked about this when we were talking about Jesus Christ. Our redemption has been paid by the blood of the Lamb. And those He sets free are what? Free indeed. Do we celebrate this? Do we burn up the yeast of sin in our homes so God will love us? Oh, Jesus, do you see what I did? Oh, Jesus, do you love me now? No, Jesus loves you already. But we are redeemed children of the King. And God wants His people, hear me, to live lives that honor Him. That's what this is about. We've been bought with the blood of God Almighty. And we are the bride of Christ. And He's like, clean it out. Clean it out. Let me tell you guys something and then I'm going to let you go. I'm talking about Christian families. I don't, I'm not talking about the world. God's given me a ministry to lift up God's people. And I'm talking about Christians here. And in the church today, profanity is often as common as thank you. And you guys say after I read a sin, clean it out. Let's try that. Profanity is as common as thank you. Clean it out. That's right. Parents putting girls on birth control pills. Angry men who are a nuisance to live with. Women spewing out gossip. Wives who belittle their husbands. Millions and millions spent on pornography. Absent fathers. Children flipping off their parents. Affairs leaving children broken and bleeding. Divorce off the charts. Couples living together outside of marriage. Families cussing at each other. Violence and abuse. Clean out out the yeast of your homes because God wants to be on the top of your no fun list. No, because it blesses your home. Don't you see that? It blesses you. Sin's destroying the church. And we banner and raise the flag of being saved by the blood of the Lamb. And then we go to our homes and we try to clean out the yeast of sin so we can be a blessed people, a blessed people. I only got through half of it. We'll finish it next week. Go from this place and shine for your King Jesus. I will shine for our King Jesus. And let it begin at home. It begin at home. God bless you all.